It's always nice when someone smart and well-spoken agrees with your position. It gives you confidence that you've thought about the issues correctly, even if the well-spoken person hasn't actually said anything substantial. In this respect, William Lane Craig is a con man. Con, of course, being short for confidence. When people ask him tough questions about Christianity, he delivers practiced answers in a calmly arrogant tone, which makes people feel protected and reassured. But when you rewind the tape and think about what he actually said, you realize that his answers don't really solve anything, and many of them simply raise even more questions. It's not an exercise in doing good philosophy, it's an exercise in projecting confidence. As I was looking for reference material for another video, I realized that William Lane Craig makes a habit of answering challenges to Christianity in the most simplistic and ad hoc ways I've seen from any apologist. Were it not for his polished delivery, I honestly don't think anyone would take this man seriously. If you know someone who relies on William Lane Craig for reassurance that Christianity is true, if they feel confident in their conclusions because William Lane Craig has done the legwork, this video is for that person. First, let's look at Craig's answer to the question of why God couldn't have created a world where everyone was saved and no one had to go to hell. It may be that if there are worlds of universal salvation, that they have overriding deficiencies that make them less preferable. And one that I thought of, for example, would be maybe they've only got two or three people in them. And if he were to create any more, then at least one of them would reject God. And, and that would seem to be a pretty deficient world. So the only problem with a possible world containing just two people is it would be deficient. What does that mean? In what metaphysical sense is a world with two people not enough? What metaphysical rule, or what characteristic of God, would this violate? In fact, here's a question for Craig. How many people would you expect the Christian God to want? Ten? Ten thousand? Ten trillion? At what point is the number of people no longer deficient? And while we're on the subject, couldn't you argue that having just one Earth is deficient? Imagine how much more praise God could have received if he'd made ten Earths, all orbiting around the sun, all singing his praise, free from each other's influence, just in case a few of them turned completely Muslim or Hindu, right? Surely, just having one Earth is pretty deficient, don't you think? It kind of seems like he expects his audience to not think. Another suspiciously impotent answer given by Craig is actually one which I was looking for as I outlined the other video I mentioned. This is the question of why God doesn't make his existence a lot more obvious if it's such an important piece of information. In his answer, Craig appeals to the idea that not only would it be coercive for God to prove his existence, but also that it wouldn't really help to bring people into a loving relationship with himself anyway. God isn't interested in just getting people to believe that he exists, to add one more piece of furniture to their ontology of the universe. He wants to bring people into a loving, saving relationship with himself. I think that we can trust God's wisdom in providentially ordering the world in such a way that people are given adequate but not coercive evidence for his existence. And the question then for us is how will we respond to that? So God wants a loving relationship with us, but for some reason this does not require, nor apparently is it even assisted by, any kind of certainty that he actually exists in the first place. But Craig is surely aware that the first step in any loving relationship is to learn that the other person exists. Otherwise, he'd be mad at his wife for having intruded upon his life, forcing him to believe in her existence before they started dating. Even if his wife had some kind of coercive trait about her, like being a billionaire, for example, and she was worried that he'd only love her for her money, she would still need to introduce herself unambiguously first, and then she could later entrust him with this difficult information once she thought he could handle it honestly. Craig gives no thought to how this answer might commit him to ridiculous conclusions in other areas of his life. He simply seems to get tunnel vision when confronted with a serious challenge to his religion. As long as he has something, anything, to say in response, and as long as he can deliver his drivel with practiced confidence, that's all he seems to care about.
Craig's waffly answer on this question reminded me of another question Craig once answered, which is why a god who loves his creations would allow so much animal suffering in nature. And such an ecosystem must be balanced if it's to be viable. The Canadian authorities are reintroducing wolves into the wild in Canada. Why? Because in the absence of these predators, the caribou herds were overpopulating, and as a result, they were overgrazing, and therefore dying of starvation. The predators actually enhanced the survivability and the health of the caribou herds on which they preyed. So any viable ecosystem needs to have predation in it in order to succeed. Right, because an all-powerful, all-loving god couldn't simply limit the fertility rate of animals so it always stays in balance with the plant life. Nope. Apparently the only way to balance an ecosystem is to have the plant eaters physically ripped apart by... monsters. Apparently there's just no other possible way for an all-powerful god to balance an ecosystem. And people actually believe this tripe when it comes out of Craig's mouth. And just to really hammer home the kinds of answers Craig seems content to give, I want everyone to remember this answer he gave to the question of why we ought to obey God's commands. Craig loves to argue that atheists cannot justify their moral truth claims, and that atheists ultimately have no foundation for why something is right or wrong. So how does Craig justify his moral truth claims? What is Craig's ultimate foundation for morality? Why is it right to obey God's commands? Suppose you say that the reason we should obey God's commands is because he has commanded us to. In other words, God's commands are self-inclusive. If God has said, obey all that I command you, then that is itself something that he has commanded us. And so it would be comprised in itself. And it seems to me that this is a perfectly legitimate justification for uh, saying why we should obey God. A perfect circle! I couldn't help but notice the shit-eating grin on Craig's face right after he gave that circular answer. Look at that. That is the face of a man who knows he's said something ridiculous. That is not the face of a serious thinker. That is the face of a smartass. Craig knows that he's made a circular argument, an argument which anyone could make about any moral system. But it doesn't matter, because he was asked a question, and he said words in response. Mission accomplished. It should boggle everyone's mind that a degreed philosopher would offer such pathetic solutions to such fundamental problems. But honestly, it doesn't surprise me that this is the man William Lane Craig grew up to be. When you hear Craig talk about how he first became a Christian as a young teenager, you realize that his actions as an adult make perfect sense. Christianity is his emotional support ideology. By his own telling, teenage Bill Craig was extremely sad, depressive, isolated, and angsty, like most teenagers. Most teenagers feel this way, and most teenagers eventually overcome these feelings through self-exploration and just the passage of time. Craig likes to dress up his teenage issues as being uniquely philosophical, but it's the same journey that most intelligent teenagers go through. As I moved into my teenage years, I began to ask the big questions in life. Who am I? Why am I here? Where am I going? And as I wrestled with these questions, I found myself sinking into ever deeper despair. In the face of my own eventual death, and ultimately the inevitable extinction of mankind and the heat death of the universe, everything seemed so pointless. It was only later in life that I learned that I was experiencing what existentialist philosophers call angst. Most people call me teen angst, but you can come up with whatever pet name you want for me. A deep despair or hopelessness at the core of one's being in the face of the absurdity of life. Angst, angst. 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 In the search for answers, I began to attend a large church in our community. But instead of answers, all I found was a social country club where the dues were a dollar a week in the offering plate. That's fair, I guess. The other high school students who pretended to be such good Christians on Sunday, well, I knew what kind of lives they were really living the rest of the week. 
I resented their hypocrisy and phoniness, and so I began to withdraw into myself. I thought, I don't need people. So much teenage angst. I was on my way to becoming a very alienated young man. The anger and the hopelessness that I felt just ate away at me inside. If I start to get a little too out of control and my friend depression butts in, it's important to talk to a trusted adult. Depression can make you feel pretty sad and isolated. But when he was confronted with this problem that all teenagers face in some form or another, Craig took a cheap shortcut to feel better. Instead of weathering the storm, Craig simply latched onto the reassuring idea that someone important, God, loved him and had a place for him in the world, and this ultimately made him think that his problem was not, you know, being a normal teenager, but some kind of spiritual deficiency, some kind of supernatural voodoo that was interfering with his true self. Okay, now this next set of clips is kind of long, but in the words of Napoleon Bo excuse me, as stated by the highly influential French philosopher Napoleon Bonaparte, never interrupt your enemy when he is making a mistake. Then one day, when I was feeling particularly miserable, I walked into my high school German class and sat down behind a girl who's one of these types, you know, that is always so happy. She turned around and I said, Sandy, what are you always so happy about for anyway? And she said, well, Bill, it's because I know Jesus Christ is my personal savior. And I said, well, I go to church. And she said, that's not enough, Bill. You've got to have him really living in your heart. Well, what would he want to do a thing like that for? She said, because he loves you, Bill. And that hit me like a ton of bricks. Here I was so filled with anger and despair. And she said there was someone who really loved me. And who was it? but the God of the universe. And that thought just staggered me to think that the God of the universe could love that worm named Bill Craig down there on that speck of dust called planet Earth. I read the New Testament from cover to cover, and as I did so, I was captivated by the person Jesus of Nazareth. His words had the ring of truth about them, and his life had an authenticity which was not characteristic of those who claimed to be his followers in the church I was attending. I found that I could not reject him. On the contrary, I was drawn to him. I learned that my problem was sin. I knew that although my life was externally upright, my heart was selfish and twisted within. I learned that as a result, I was spiritually dead and alienated from God. Craig does not seem to have realized that most teenagers feel the same way, and that most teenagers get over their angst and isolation with time and effort, and or just getting used to your new hormones. I, too, was a very sad, depressive, and angsty teenager. I had very similar depressive thoughts when I was that age. But I got over it, just like most teenagers get over it. It just takes some time, and ideally, some self-exploration. This is why teenagers say and do stupid shit. They're exploring their boundaries and seeing what kind of people they are. But it seems that young Bill Craig instead chose the convenient emotional placebo, one which he still holds onto as an adult. And now, as he looks back at the difference between teenage Bill and adult Bill, Craig believes that without Christianity, his life would simply be unlivable, hopeless, and absurd. The way he talks about life without God, and the way he describes how a consistent atheist should behave, he seems to think that if he stopped believing in God, then he would go right back to being the same miserable, depressive, and angsty teenager he used to be. Thus on atheism, life itself becomes ultimately meaningless. If God does not exist, then life is without ultimate purpose, value, or significance. Confronted with the human predicament about the only solution the atheist can offer is that we simply face the absurdity of life and live bravely. The fundamental problem with this solution, however, is that it's impossible to live consistently and happily within the framework of such a worldview. If you live consistently, you will not be happy. If you live happily, 
it is only because you are not consistent. So what does all this have to do with the terrible answers Craig provides in defense of Christianity? Well, it really helps to explain why Craig is content to give these simplistic yet confident veneers of answers. His ultimate goal is not to understand reality. His goal is, and always has been, to protect his happiness. William Lane Craig is afraid that, without Christianity, he would go back to feeling sad, depressive, and angsty. So of course he has to say something, anything, to defend his emotional teddy bear. In my opinion, William Lane Craig is a man who never finished growing up. He outgrew his depressive teenage mindset, but he's become so attached to his teenage crutch, his emotional support ideology, that he cannot even imagine how any other person could live without it, or something like it. As an adult, Craig lives in fear that if he lost his religion, he'd go right back to being a depressive and angsty teenager. He jumped into a lifeboat full of holes, and now he has to spend the rest of his adult life plugging those holes, offering any and every possible response, throwing everything at the wall, and hoping that some of it, any of it, will stick. God can't be happy with only two good people because, um, it would be deficient, or something, whatever. And God can't reveal himself because, uh, that's just not how loving relationships work, except for all the other loving relationships we have. And God needs predators because, well, that must be the only way to balance an ecosystem, since it's the way God apparently did it. And we must obey God's commands because we, well, well, because we must obey God's commands. It's uh, self-inclusive. Yeah, that sounds good enough, right? Pay no attention to the reasoning. Just be happy that the words sound good when you say them. Craig has even gone so far as to say that reason itself should capitulate to Christianity, that it should serve his religion like a handmaiden. It's helpful to understand the difference between what Martin Luther called the magisterial and the ministerial uses of reason. The magisterial use of reason is when reason stands over and above the gospel message like a magistrate and judges it. The ministerial use of reason is when reason submits to the gospel message and serves it as a handmaiden. And Luther argued, I think correctly, that reason um, is primarily to be used in the, or to be used in the ministerial role. Reason is a tool that God has given us to help better understand and defend our faith. But I think the way in which we fundamentally know that our faith is true is through the inner witness of the Holy Spirit. My faith in Christ is not based upon arguments and evidence. William Lane Craig is not a serious intellectual in this discussion space. William Lane Craig is the person who insists on bringing his emotional support peacock onto the airplane, even though it shits all over the place. His entire career is a confidence game. My purpose in making this video is not to argue that Craig's ideas are necessarily wrong on this basis, but to show that no one's confidence in the truth of Christianity should be bolstered by William Lane Craig. Christianity just so happens to be Craig's emotional support ideology, and he's made a career out of being a con man for Christ.